There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send a Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. children each night. Over the week, we reached a total of 75 different children. Each night, the, in the attendance increased, and each night, we had new uh, kids who came to BBS. It was good. And while it has been a great experience, our director explained to the volunteer team early on that her choice of curriculum was driven to help the children of our county place their trust in the one true God. Because people have a lot of different ideas about a lot of different little G gods. And since none of us have been to the afterlife, we are also exposed to many false ideas of what happens after death. Today's text that was just dramatized for us, a lesson is told by someone who has experienced the other side of death. And this story teaches us some essential values that should shape our lives on this side of the grave and our destiny on the other side. Now, in addition to the 16 commentaries on Luke that I've been consulting for this series, I found a helpful preaching sermon from D.A. Carson back in March of 2012. It's a wonderful sermon on this passage. He goes into a lot more detail than I do. So after the sermon, if you find yourself wanting more, you can do a Google search for the parable of the rich man and Lazarus by D.A. Carson. Now, I realize when I talk about the rich man and Lazarus, you're probably thinking, well, neither one of them is me. I'm not rich, but I'm surely not as bad off as Lazarus either. Well, I encourage you to listen closely, pay attention, because at the end of the message, I'm going to point out that we may be richer than we think. Jesus just may be talking to us as he tells this story. Following last week's parable of the dishonest manager, Jesus tells another parable in today's passage about a man who selfishly mishandles his wealth. 
The story describes for us a drama of differences. I find at least five differences between the rich man and Lazarus. The first is in their dress. The rich man is described as wearing purple and fine linen. I, I think this is, it, it tells us that he was elaborate all the way to the skin. See, purple was worn on the outside, and the process of dyeing purple fabric required a very rare type of shell that was used to create the purple dye. And because it was so rare, it was very expensive, so only the aristocrats wore purple, and if they did wear purple, they wore it on the outside so everybody could see that they were wearing the expensive designer label. But it says he also wore fine linen. And this word fine linen actually uh, describes a very silky type of an undergarment that most people could not afford. It was worn next to the skin for comfort. So he was comfortable from the skin out, and he wore purple on the outside so that everybody knew how comfortable he was. See, this man is not wearing a Fruit of the Loom or a Haynes canvas t-shirt. He's wearing the high dollar stuff. This word for fine linen actually only appears in this text and in Revelations 18 and 19. In Revelations 18 and 19, we talk about the fine linen of Babylon that gives way but then those who come back from heaven with Jesus are dressed in fine linen. See, it's a very, a very uh, expensive, very fine garment that people in the everyday were not allowed to wear. We couldn't afford to wear this fine garment. But this man was dressed in fine linen, just as the saints who come back with Jesus are dressed in fine linen. But in contrast to the rich man's dress, what was it the Lazarus man had? All we do is we discover the source. Some sort of a blister or an ulcer. That's all he had for his coat. See, I, I see a, a very strong difference between their dress. I also see a strong difference in their dwelling. One man lived behind a gate. And a gate doesn't do any good unless you have a wall. Here was a man who lived behind a walled fortress with a gate. But Lazarus? He was outside of the gate. Now notice it doesn't say that Lazarus, that Lazarus sat at the gate. It tells us that Lazarus was laid at the gate. See, unlike those who were mobile and who would travel to and from the market or to and from the temple to beg at the market or the temple as people wandered by, if a person was too weak to travel of his own, he would be laid at the gate of one of the wealthy citizens. And by laying a a sick person at the gate of a wealthy citizen, it was a sign that the community expected that wealthy person to care for this sick one at his gate. Now, to care for that sick person outside of his gate would have meant very little for this rich man. He would not have been inconvenienced. Usually, he would just assign one of his staff, one of the servants, to go see what was needed to care for the sick one who was laid at his gate. But instead of this man acknowledging the humanity of Lazarus and doing the humane thing by sending his servants to see what was needed, he remained in his dwelling, he remained behind the wall, and it tells us that only the dogs even acknowledge. These are perhaps the guard dogs of the estate. And 
So the faith lit the wounds of poor Lazarus. Now, do not think that the licking of the wounds was somehow uh, something positive and something therapeutic. Because the licking of dogs would, would have conjured up thoughts of how did the wild dogs treat a carcass when they find it on their bones? The licking of the wounds was just one small step away from the consuming of the carcass. See, the rich man did not acknowledge Lazarus' humanity. The only that even acknowledged that he was there were the dogs who were thinking, we're about to eat. At least one commentator, Craig Keener, in the, in the IVP, uh, Bible background commentary of the New Testament, suggests that Lazarus' death in verse 22 was actually the direct result of this rich man's neglect. That this man who stayed behind his walls and his gate allowed the man to starve to death on his very See, they were different in their dress, they were different in their dwelling, they were also different in their diet. For the rich man was feasting sumptuously daily. Every meal of this man was a celebration of all that he had accumulated. Just as his underwear was not ordinary, his diet was not hamburgers and hot dogs. It was so special that this is the only occurrence in the Bible of this word sumptuously. You know, we read about other feasts, but this man's feasts were so extravagant that Luke uses a word that only appears in this place. I mean, this is extravagant feasting. The only other place that a word similar to this sumptuous feast and then Acts chapter 26, 13, where we read about something that shines as bright as the sun. That's the extent. The brightness of the sun is how sumptuous this man's feast for. I think the opulence of this feasting could be compared to the impression one would have walking to a certain gold-plated tower in New York City. And so that I don't get accused of only picking on one political party or one politician, it would also be like the reaction that many Americans had when a certain politician in an attempt to relate to the people showed a $24,000 freezer filled with $12 per pint ice cream. See, whether it's a gold-gilded tower or $12 ice cream, we get the idea that this is sumptuous feasting. In contrast to this sumptuous feast, Lazarus simply wanted the food that fell from the table. In other words, he wanted the dog food. <coughs> See, in, in the day before pet, Dogs were either guard dogs or they were wild scavengers. And so the dogs of an estate would have been working guard dogs. And before Purina or Simmons, the only feed for the Dobermans and the Rottweilers would have been the leftovers from the feast. Or if these dogs were not the trained guard working dogs, they would have been the strays who rummaged the garbage for survival. Either way, it's the dogs who ate that which fell from the table. And Lazarus wasn't invited to the sumptuous feast. He simply wanted to have his share of the dog food. What a difference in dress, in dwelling, in diet. And I did stretch a little bit, but I did find a deed. For dogs, in the name of the individual. Because Lazarus is named, but the rich man is never given a name. However, centuries 
later, the Bible was translated into Latin, and from the Latin word for wealthy, we get the word dies. So if you read certain Bibles, it will say this is a parable of dies and Lazarus. Dies is the unnamed wealthy man. Well, since dies is too close to Dave for my comfort, I'll refer to him for the rest of the morning as Richard. Richard the rich man. Now please, just remember that even if I refer to him as Richard, in the story he was the anonymous rich man, and he is not to be likened to anybody that you know by the name of Richard. I am not making any connections. This is a man, Richard, who was arrogant in his self-sufficiency. An unnamed rich man compared to Lazarus. Now, Lazarus was the Greek adaptation of the Hebrew name Eleazar. And Eleazar simply means the one whom God helps. So the story is a contrast between the rich man who was self-sufficient versus the one who receives God's help. Eleazar was the name of Abraham's servant in Genesis chapter 15. The one who would have received all of Abraham's inheritance if Ishmael and Isaac had not been born. Eleazar, or Lazarus, would have been a famous name in the minds of those who knew their Jewish history. And so the contrast is between Richard the rich man who is anonymous with the beggar whom God helps. And that contrast cannot be uh, overstated in any way. We can think of this story as the contrast of any who try to rely upon their own selves and those who realize our need for help and ask and receive help from God. See, these men were different in their dress, in their dwelling, in their diet, in their name of dives, and also even to their very death. Richard's burial is described in verse 22, and is contrasted to Lazarus' death without burial. See, a greater contrast could not exist between the anonymous end of Lazarus' earthly life and the rich man who would have received full burial rites, costly anointing and preparing of his, and wrapping of the corpse before burial. They would have hired days of public mourners to greet his, his death. They would have marked his sepulcher as belonging to him. And then there would have been a public memorial. Don't offend the grave, the burial, the resting place of Richard the Rich. But Greg Keener writes, Lazarus, having neither relatives nor a charitable patron, did not receive a funeral. Whereas the rich man would have received great eulogies. Five differences between Richard the rich man and Lazarus, who called and received help from God. You know, I, I think these men have lived as inequitably as anyone could imagine. There's a secular academic book by Walter Scheidel that proposes the only remedy for this type of inequity is violence or catastrophe. The violence or catastrophe are the only forces that can remedy this type of inequity. But the Bible says that death is the great leveler. Because Hebrews 9.27 states that it is appointed for all men to die once, and then face judgment. 
Yet verse 24 in front of us reveals that this death is not a leveling, but it is a reversal. Because in the verses that follow, we see a discussion of privilege. Verses 24 through 31 is an exchange of three statements from Richard and three replies from Abraham. See, I see in verses 24 through 26 that Richard the rich man is still self-focused. He calls on Father Abraham three times in these final verses. See, this man is playing the race card. Father Abraham, you know I'm a good Jewish boy, and good Jewish boys deserve special treatment three times. And as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, most Jews in Jesus' day presumed that all Jews go to heaven unless they did something horrendous. And I mean Hitler kind of horrendous. That's the only thing that would have kept a good Jew from going to Abraham's rest. And so Richard plays this race card, and even after death, he still presumes to be entitled to special treatment. He has no regard for Lazarus whatsoever, but he says, um, but what about me? Quench my thirst. I'm the one in torment here. He doesn't ask to leave the torment. He realizes that there is no second chance. Once you cross death, there is no second chance to make a new choice. So he knows he can't leave his torment, but he shows no remorse for the way that he lived. He had no concern for any of the others who were in torment with him. He was simply self-absorbed. He didn't say, send Lazarus to cool our thirst. It's all about rich. He has no concern for the others, and he still believes, even in hell, that he deserves special treatment. Does that sound like anybody that you know? Perhaps it does. But when he says, please send Lazarus to quench my thirst, Abraham replies, I can't do it. See, a chasm has been fixed. And this chasm is not a new chasm. This is just another expression of the gap that exists between sin and the holiness that has existed ever since creation. God cannot dwell in wickedness. And as long as we choose to act selfishly and sinfully, there's a gap between us and the holiness of God. Fortunately, God has remedied that chasm by providing Christ who crosses over the chasm and invites us to come with him. But the chasm still exists. And Abraham points out the comfort that Lazarus has now received. But he instructs not only can Lazarus Rich, you can't come from there to here, but also Lazarus can't come from here to there. Even in his death, Richard is self-absorbed. As a matter of fact, he's so self-absorbed, even verses 27 to 29, he still thinks of Lazarus as his servant. Rich says, hey, 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 Abraham, why don't you send Lazarus to do what I want him to do? The rich man refuses to acknowledge that Lazarus is now honored and rewarded by God as a guest in his presence. Richard, the rich man, still sees Lazarus as a servant to be commanded to do his bidding. And Richard isn't concerned about anybody other than his own family, who were presumably living the same way he did, behind the walls, behind the gate, feasting sumptuously. But Abraham responds to this bidding Lazarus to go. Abraham says, they have the word of God. The word of God is sufficient to bring repentance. See, too many people today are still 
looking for a new revelation, looking for new signs and new wonders. But the scriptures, even before the resurrection has taken place, the scriptures are sufficient to bring regeneration and to tell us the plan of God. Richard is still self-focused. He still thinks he can command Lazarus around. And in verses 30 and 31, Richard knows best. Abraham says, let him follow the scriptures. And Richard said, no, 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 you don't understand. How arrogant, how presumptuous. See, we don't have a picture of hell of people who are now sorrowful for their sins. We have people who are just as arrogant to death as they were on this earth. See, hell is not filled with sorry people. It's filled with people who are allowed to live fully their rebellious inclinations and their choices. It's not filled with those who willingly acknowledge God, but those who are forced by their circumstances to admit, yes, he truly is the righteous judge. And even after Richard has found the consequences of his selfishness, he has the arrogance to argue with Abraham. He still refuses to admit that God knows what's best. And as Jesus is telling this story, Jesus has already revealed that he is on his way to Jerusalem, and Jesus knows what's going to happen in Jerusalem. So Jesus tells this story to say, even if someone rises from the dead, it's not going to convince a person who won't listen to the scriptures. And to this day, there are people who know the Easter account, yet they still try to get to God by their own doing. Allow me to draw now from the drama and from the discussion and find four details that are too important for us to miss. The first is this. Life continues in one of two destinations. There's no mention of a safe zone where people maneuver out of hell to the safe zone into heaven. There's, there's no safe zone that's dependent upon, all right, now you get a second chance to decide, or it's not dependent upon the prayers of the people on earth, or baptism by people on earth for those who are in torment. There's no mention of ceasing to exist. Both the one who is comforting and the one who is in anguish, anguish are consciously aware of their state. See, we've not been to the other side of death, so we can't describe it. But this scripture, by someone who has been on the other side, says, our life continues in one of two places. We also can't miss the fact that biblical repentance follows self-awareness. The person who is unaware of his lostness may not be inclined to receive the gift of salvation. And the accomplishments of this world, wealth, fame, influence, power, may blind us to our need for grace. Too many people have convinced themselves that, well, I know worse than the next guy, so I'm okay. But what if the next guy isn't okay either? If nothing else, this pandemic has illustrated for us that a person can be contagious without any symptoms. And there are people around us who are condemned to a crisis eternity even though they don't appear to have any symptoms. But when we truly recognize our brokenness, what the Sermon on the Mount calls being broken in spirit or poor in spirit, we are then positioned to confess our sin and to receive the help that only God offers. What the Bible calls repentance. The third thing we need to, uh, that's too important for us to miss when we look at this story, is that biblical truth 
is better than any isolated experience. See, too many movies and books have been written upon the near-death experiences and abnormal phenomena. But the Word of God has been preserved through the centuries. It's been translated into more languages than any other literary work, and it is more authoritative than any dream or any vision any person may have. The face of Jesus on the tortilla, the shape of a face on the side of a glass building where the lawn sprinkler left water minerals, the person with the capillaries who burst in their palms do not add or take away from the credibility of God's revelation to man that has been recorded from the breathing out of his very spirit. Amen? Amen. Because the witness of Scripture is sufficient to reveal the plan of God. Fourthly, it's too important to miss that disregard for others is contemptible. Even though there is no indication that if the rich man would have fed Lazarus, that he would have somehow merited a pass into heaven, his lack of concern for Lazarus was just an indication of a deeper problem. He was so self-absorbed, he didn't care about others. Yet to disregard another image bearer, even for eternity, deserves contempt by the angels and the saints in heaven, as well as all the God-fearing men on earth. See, the rich man in Jesus' parable lived selfishly, and he falsely believed that his earthly comfort would only be multiplied in the world to come. But apart from the help that God gives, imparting the righteousness of Christ to your account, all of us, are bound to get the reward for our selfishness and experience the same torment as this man. But the good news is that God does extend help to any who will admit their sin, believe that Jesus paid the penalty for that sin, and confess him as their new Lord. This lesson challenges each of us to consider our own selfishness in this life towards others. God's word says in 1 John chapter 3, If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? And compared to other countries, if you have a roof over your head, if you eat at least one meal a day, you are wealthier than over half the people in the world. And I wonder, does our love extend to them? Or are we too comfortable behind our walls, ignoring the person on the other side of the gate? And we are surrounded by people who are just as deluded by it as this man in the story living only for themselves with some misconception of where they're headed after death. But to apply this verse a little differently, I, I leave out just one word and see if this sounds like us. But if anyone has the goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide him? And I mean to have the goods. I mean anyone who knows the gospel. If you know the plan of salvation, if you have the goods, you see a brother in need, yet close your heart against them. Do we love them enough to share the gospel? Because the reality is, is for most of the people in this room, we have goods. We 
we've been entrusted the keys to the kingdom. We know the way that that other person can experience salvation. The question is, are we like the rich men ignoring the people who need it? Do we love them enough to share the gospel? Our closing song this morning is number 447 in your books. The words will be behind me as we remind ourselves that freely we have received the gospel, we should freely give to others. Let's stand as we sing.